Today is Friday, December 1st. As usual, this is our weekly video where we round up a bunch of AI papers that were published this week, some of which were published last week as well, I think. Uh, and we have some GPT made summaries of them, as well as the GPT bot made some prereq knowledge to read before you read the paper, just to make sure you know what's happening, as well as some citations that are probably incorrect. If you want to read all of this, Go ahead, check out my Substack link in description for the full weekly newsletter. Uh, I say let's get right to it. Towards comparable active learning uh, addresses the challenges in evaluating and comparing active learning algorithms. AL is a technique used in machine learning to select the most informative samples for labeling, reducing the need for extensive manual annotation. However, the reported performance of AI algorithms in the literature is often inconsistent and difficult to compare due to variations in data sets, model architectures, and evaluation protocols. So AL, a technique used, I don't know what this is, to, in machine learning to select the most informative samples for labeling. So I think what's happening here, what they're saying is like, uh, you have a huge data set that is unlabeled and you need to manually go through, pay some humans or do it yourself, lots of lots of labor hours, right? to label this data because labeling is what allows it to be trained on, right? Uh, rather than just picking random 10% of the data, these AL techniques, their goal is to make a model that predicts which data you should pick that will be best for labeling for learning on, um, which is interesting. I assume what it's effectively doing there is just checking the perplexity of the data, how complex it is, the entropy in it, and um, taking whichever data has the most perplexity and using that. Maybe if they make an AL model that is specialized to a given field that has already seen similar-ish data to that field before, um, maybe that uh, makes it more complex than that and actually allows it to pick out features that are unique to that purpose, maybe. Um, that's just my guess as to what all this all means. Um, and they are trying to adjust the challenge of evaluating and comparing these algorithms. So, not my area of interest, but sounds pretty interesting, gotta say. Uh, check it out. Heck. To see is to believe, prompting GPT-4 vision for better visual instruction tuning. Address the challenge of generating accurate and context-aware visual instructions. Uh, they introduce a new data set called blah, 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 which contains 220,000 visually aligned and context-aware instructions. The data set is generated by prompting the powerful GPT-4V model with images from the LVIS data set, which has comprehensive object annotations. Uh, conduct experiments to evaluate the effectiveness of their data set by training a state-of-the-art multimodal model, LAVA 1.5, using this data set. Compare performance of their model with other language multimodal models on various benchmarks, including traditional visual question answering. Cool. Um, not my thing. Not in a vision early or vision prompting. Uh, but I just want to point out here, I hate when we're using GPT-4 to make our open source models. Don't get me wrong. I, I get that like there's stuff with data distillation where you actually can get extremely high quality models out of it. But I would rather the open source community be ahead, not behind using closed AI's model. Um, I'm not fond of that, but let's fix that soon. Survey on AI ethics, a socio-technical perspective. What does that perspective mean? Da -da -da -da. Discuss the principles, privacy, data protection, safety, robustness, transparency, explainability, fairness, blah, 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 blah. Um, I, I don't know why I downloaded this. Uh, vulnerability machine learning models who attacks the compromise security. Yeah, I don't know why I downloaded that one. That's not, I don't care. Studying artist sentiments around AI generated artwork. What do the artists think of AI art? Da -da -da. Collected data from social media platforms, Reddit, Twitter, and ArtStation, and conducted interviews with seven artists. Data was analyzed using a mathematic analysis approach. Only seven artists? Only seven? You couldn't, couldn't have done 30 or something? Are you serious? Um, Findings revealed several themes related to artists' hopes about the development and use of generative AI tools. Firstly, they express excitement about the new possibilities of visualizing their imaginations through these tools. Saw generative AI as a way to create fantastic imaginary artwork that may not be possible in reality. Uh, also saw these tools as collaborative tools that can be used for idea generation and brainstorming. Impressed by the abilities of generative AI tools, they recognized the quality and realism of their generative artwork and were surprised by how good the tools were. 
Uh, they appreciated the accessibility that these tools provide. They believe that more people can now create digital art and explore creativity. Um, it is important to note that while many artists expressed positive towards generative tools, they were also concerned with criticism. Some artists, this is a boring paper so far, some artists were worried about the potential plagiarism of their artwork and their use of their art styles, and that is without their, without their consent. Um, the use of their work to train is an interesting um, it's, it's an interesting uh, complaint. I see it at first glance, um, and I see it for models that over-parameterize such that they can actually recreate from memory exactly. Um, but, like, even a human, is, is it not legal for a human to just recreate someone else's artist from memory to the best of their ability? Is that not totally fine? I thought that was totally fine. I could be wrong on that, though. Um, and this idea that, like, oh, it's learning off of my art, well... Yeah, so do humans, like, um, not that I know the actual order of art history or anything, but, like, uh, Picasso looked at Monet paintings and learned from Monet, and that influenced his style. And Picasso probably could have, if he wanted to, replicate a Monet painting. Probably have artist order mixed up in influencers and everything. But you get my point. Like, it doesn't make any sense to... Uh, like, humans learn the same way in a, in a vague sense. So I'm not really very fond of those critiques. Um... Others express concerns about the impact of these tools on creative industry and the value of traditional artistic skills. Yeah, I really, I've been saying this for a while, is like, not just visual painting, vision, like art, but also just any kind of creative outlet, so music or even research, right? What I see happening soon um, is the average person in the field is not actually creative. And I define creativity as like the ability to generate a new idea that is both new and recognized as useful by the human utility function, right? Most artists I see can't do that. Most artists I see are people who like to do art. They are not creatives. There's a difference. Um, and I think that people who like to do art or people who have made a living off of their ability to like have a hand that can draw very well um, will, in this short term, lose their jobs because why would I like the the extent to which this is now so cheap you've seen my you might have seen my videos with my powerpoints and the graphics and everything like I can get effectively free I mean I guess I pay 20, I pay 20 bucks a month for um 20 bucks a month for gbd4 but whatever like effectively free high quality artwork um and I think in most scenarios for most business cases or just general use cases, AI art is good. The thing that will be left over that will actually be useful for artists is those artists who can create new styles and new ideas and that kind of thing, right? Um, there's some debate as to whether like just the prompt engineering will be able to create new styles, maybe. Um, I think probably um, to some extent, but I, I do think there'll be a, a role left in this world for the type of musicians and artists and whatever who are actually inventing new genres of music and that kind of thing, right? Whereas the ones who are just like recycling old pop tropes, if you're um, effectively a cover band in disguise kind of thing, like you're not going to, sorry. Um, now that's the short term. They'll lose their jobs. But moving into a bit longer term, I do see how, what happens, what will happen is um, people will value AI art, uh, or sorry, human art, the same way that people value Made in America logos, because we don't want to buy Made in China or wherever else in the world, right? We like to keep the, the money here. Um, I'm in America, obviously. Uh, I think that there will be a made by human, like, stamp of approval or certified board or a nonprofit uh, uh, something or other, or just you can just say it on your products kind of thing. Um, and I think people who have money will... It'll be like a hoity-toity thing to like, oh, I paid a person to make this artwork. It's not an AI art. This is an actual like people art kind of thing. I think companies will start doing this too, um, especially the big ones who can afford to, is uh, they will brag about only using human artists. Um, I think there'll be a lot of stuff like that. And, and that's and that's in that sense, but also just like to human labor in general. We'll see a lot of that, of um, people... Uh, who can afford to do so, people who effectively like are not on UBI, who have capital from before the UBI came, or still have whatever jobs they may have potentially, they will be uh, spending that extra income on uh, human-generated uh, media, uh, work product, everything, um, just to say that they can, right? Uh, cool, whatever. 
some intriguing aspects about Lipschitz continuity of neural networks. Uh, I'm not going to actually read the summary in this one. I already said it. I want to, I want to read it. I think, um, uh, actually I will just because, um, measure of smoothness. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Lipschitz continuity just means like the loss function, like how smooth it is. It's like a strict measure of that, uh, that we often assume to be true, even though we have no proof of such. I want to understand it. Um, and behavior during training. Yeah, this is just, I, I have like a backlog of um, functional interpretability papers that I want to read that I one day will, um, but not anytime soon, I don't think. Probably like at least three months, if not longer. Uh, oh, that's the wrong folder. Wrong folder. Some. Okay. Shadows don't lie and lines can't bend. Generative models don't know projective geometry for now. Uh, they produce images with geometric features that differ from those of real images, indicating a lack of understanding of projective geometry. Uh, they curate a data set of real and generated images, ensuring that biases related to color, texture, and local features were eliminated. They then use three classifiers that analyze geometric properties and detect inconsistencies in the generated images. Classifiers focused on perspective fields, line segments, and object shadow relations. Analysis revealed systematic errors in the generated images, such as misaligned vanishing points, inaccurate shadow alignment, and perspective field discrepancies. The classifiers were able to reliably detect these errors, outperforming state-of-the-art signal-based detectors. Um, cool. So the findings suggest that current models struggle to accurately reproduce projective geometry, which is essential for creating realistic images. This limitation is implications for applications that require accurate geometric representations, such as virtual reality, computer graphics, and architectural design. So this is, I guess, a, um, a hurdle to this idea that NVIDIA has. They want to make all video games, um, every single frame of your video game, rendered in AI. Uh, the study highlights the need for further research and development to improve generic models' understanding of particular geometry. Um, I bet it's a data thing, though. I'm just going to guess it's a data thing. Um, what, what are they talking about here? So projective... Can I expand, please? Uh, I'm just going to pull the whole window out. Projective geometry, right? Um, so it messes up this shadow. Yeah, there's so generated image, shadow errors. So they use some geometry somehow. Oh, they use like they drew lines in the photo to find um, correct representations, I guess, and were able to quantify how wrong the shadow was. So yeah, the shadow looks a little off, not gonna lie. Like this this top piece right here. Like why is it so long right there? Um, maybe I'm just tripping. But um detected shadow errors. Oh yeah, look at that. That this shadow of a person extends that freaking far out. Where is this shadow coming from? Where is it coming from? Um yeah, interesting, cool. This I think I'm gonna download. It's gonna be used in my do LLMs understand paper as an example of ones that do not yet understand. Um cool. Uh, but this, I think, is just a data thing. I'm not really that worried about, like, long-term not figuring this out. This is just a temporary, um, I'm going to assume, data thing. More is better in modern machine learning when infinite over-parameterization is optimal and overfitting is obligatory. Uh, investigates the benefits of parameterization overfitting. Uh, the authors focus on random feature regression, which is equivalent to shallow neural networks with only the last layer trained. Yeah, okay, because it's a regression on random features, equivalent to shallow neural networks only the last layer trained. Okay, provide theoretical results and empirical evidence to support. Oh, interesting. So because so a shallow neural network, right? Only the last layer trained has its first few layers. Uh, random and therefore and then the last layer is trained which is interesting because that means that um, whatever the input data comes in will effectively be randomly scrambled um, and I guess it will still result in features that clump together okay that's a cool concept kind of although that's not what they're going for here that's just like a prerequisite knowledge they provide theoretical results and empirical evidence to support the observation that more is better in terms of model size data and computation um, obviously more features and more data beneficial in RF regression prove that the test risk of RF regression decreases monotonically with both a number of features and the number of samples as long as the ridge penalty is tuned optimally. This implies that wider architectures with more features are preferable to narrow ones. 
Overfitting is obligatory for certain tasks. The authors showed that for a class of tasks characterized by power law eigenstructures, training to near zero training loss is necessary to achieve near optimal performance. In other words, overfitting is obligatory for these tasks, and optimal performance can only be achieved when the training error is much smaller than the test error. Interesting. Uh, mechanics involved. I'm, I'm tempted to to download this one. That that last sentence right there made me think it could be um, relevant for a, the understanding paper, which is a, a ways away, I think. But whatever. Did I... Is my computer lagging or something? I need to quit some apps real quick, sorry. Didn't realize I still have stuff open. Usually I have to shut stuff down to get quick time to work well. Just skip to the next timestamp. This might take a second. Okay, okay. Why is this not... Why is it not copying? What the heck? Oh, it was my lap. My keyboard's messed up. Sorry. Um, technical errors. More technical errors. Yeah, there we go. Working again. All right. Lost in the middle, how language models use long context. Uh, investigate how well language models use long input context to perform tasks required identifying relevant information. They focus on two tasks, multi-document question answering and key, key value retrieval. For the question answering task, the researchers analyze the performance of several state-of-the-art open and closed word language models. They vary the length of the input context by changing the number of documents and also modulate the position of the relevant information within the input context. They find that changing the position of relevant information significantly affects model performance. In particular, Models perform best when the relevant information is the beginning or end of the input context. So that was known, but I guess they're like really well like operationalizing it here or um, quantifying it. And performance degrades when models have ac have to access information in the middle of the context. This indicates that current language models do not robustly use information in long input context. Interestingly, they also observe that extended context models are not necessarily better at using their input context compared to their base counterparts. In the key value retrieval task, the researchers examine the basic ability of language models to retrieve matching tokens in the input context. Um, I'm going to add it because not that it's likely to be done, but um, the architecture that I just mostly finished writing up, um, or figuring out how it works at least, and mostly writing up, is uh, I think would help with this maybe. Um, certain versions of the long context problem will be fixed, I think. Or we'll see. Obviously, I haven't tested it yet. Um, Loop transformers are better at learning learning algorithms. Uh, propose a looped transformer architecture and training methodology to incorporate iterative characteristics into transform models. They aim to emulate the iterative learning algorithms more efficiently than standard transformers. Investigate the performance of a loop transformer in solving various data fitting problems such as linear regression, sparse linear functions, decision trees, and neural networks. Methodology for the loop transformer involves training the model to minimize the expected loss over a prompt prefixes with loop iterations. Loop transformer is compared to the standard transformer in terms of performance and parameter count. Experiments show that the loop transformer achieves performance comparable to the standard transformer while using significantly fewer parameters. Um, also discuss the key factors for finding a fixed point solution in the loop transformer. They propose input detection. Injection is a method to incorporate the input into a solution in the loop transformer. Also analyze the choice of loop. Um, I'm going to add this because it just ever so slightly sounds similar to the current architecture I just, as I said, mostly finished up. Um, it's not the same, certainly not the same, but um, it's worth a citation in the related work section of the paper for sure. Or maybe I mean. LLM state, expandable state representation for long horizon task planning in the open world. Proposes a novel state representation called LM state for long horizon task planning in an open world household environment. It representation is a mixture of structured object entries and an unstructured retrospective summary. The structured object entries provide detailed information about the attributes of relevant objects, while the retrospective summary provides additional context and insights about the task history. Oh, so it's like a multimodal model and you annotate objects? It's constructed and updated automatically with a large language model based on observations and reasoning. It uses its reasoning capabilities to track and update their attributes. Of, I don't know what's happening here, but it's not relevant to me. 
learning uniform clusters on hypersphere for deep graph level clustering. I saw the word hypersphere, gotta hop on there. I have a video on that already, a hypersphere idea. Proposes a novel deep graph level clustering method called uniform deep graph clustering to group multiple graphs into clusters. Main challenge in graph level clustering is the limited discriminability of graph level representations, which often leads to degenerate solutions. Cluster collapse. To address this issue, the UDGC claims to provide cluster level uniformity of features on a hypersphere. I don't know what's happening here. Consists of two modules, the pseudo label generation module and the representation enhancement module. Pseudo label generation module generates uniformly distributed and reliable pseudo labels using augmentation, consensual, optimal tra transport, whatever that is. It evacuates pseudo label information. I don't know what's happening here. Representation enhancement model utilizes contrastive learning to enhance the cluster level uniformity of features. It includes instance based representation enhancement and center based representation enhancement. Instance based representation enhancement uses contrastive learning to separate overlap clusters and encourage instances within the same cluster to be gathered. Center based representation enhancement aligns the centers. I don't know what's happening here. I feel like I should add it just because it says the word hypersphere, um, and I'm tempted to write a thing on that eventually and just say that they use hyperspheres for something. I got a bug in my room, ew. I really don't want to though, it looks unrelated. I'm not gonna add it, no thank you. We're trying to stay trim. It's not easy being wrong, evaluating process of elimination reasoning in large language models. Investigates the ability of large language models to perform process of elimination reasoning and the chain of thought prompting. Uh, POE with COT is a strategy where LMs reason towards incorrect options and multiple choice questions. They propose this task to enhance interpretability and self-consistency in LM decision making. I don't care. Homogeneous artificial neural network. What is that? Um, who's Polyakov with? He's somewhere in France. Paper introduces a new type of artificial neural network called homogeneous ANM, which is designed to approximate a special class of functions known as generalized homogeneous functions. These functions exhibit a symmetry with respect to a group of transformations called dilations. Paper focuses on a specific type of dilation called linear linear dilations. Um, Domains include computer science, systems theory, automatic control. For example, paper considers the problem of pattern recognition with the scaling invariance and the identification of a homogeneous dynamical system using ANN. Provides a theoretical, f um, not something I care about. Generative models. What do they know? Do they know things? Let's find out. Uh, they have the ability to internally produce high quality scene intrinsic maps such as surface normals, depth, albedo, and shading. Uh, propose a method called intrinsic LoRa that transforms any generative model into a scene intrinsic predictor. This is achieved by introducing a low ring adaptation technique which modulates key feature maps in the generative model. The LoRa parameters added to the model are minimal, constituting less than 0.6% of the total parameters. Uh, demonstrate that generative models, including diffusion models, GANs, and autoregressive models, can contain rich information about scene intrinsics. They show that I, LoRa, can extract these intrinsics with high quality outperforming state-of-the-art supervised techniques in some cases. Extracted intrinsic intrinsics include surface normals, depth, albedo, and shading. This, uh, this is useful for my understanding paper as well. Where is this? Generative. Generative AI in U.S. intellectual property law. Uh, some of you may know I used to work in uh, IP doing damages, so um, I was an like assistant to economic expert witnesses. Um, I actually was considering a paper at some point writing a paper, but I um, went pretty far through with it and found a, a big flaw. Not a flaw in my reasoning, but just I was un I was um, misinformed on the current state of what can be patented and what cannot be because it's just hard to find info to such a weird question that I had. Um, but anyways, uh, I might send the paper to a to my old boss potentially. Uh, discusses the legal and ethical implications of generative AI, particularly in relation to intellectual property rights. Uh, author highlights that generative AI systems do not have independent intellectual property rights and cannot be considered inventors or creators under U.S. patent copyright law. That's weird. I kind of think they should be on al almost. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Does it matter? Because like, because if the company owns the model, then wouldn't the model's invention still be owned by the company? I don't know.
the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and the U.S. Copyright Office have both made determinations that AI systems cannot be granted patents or copyrights. Uh, discusses the potential risk, but can, can the person who used the AI patent system to make a thing do it? I don't know. Potential risks and challenges posed by generative AI in the context of patent law raise concerns about the use of generative AI in data mining and potential for entities to exploit public data patent data sets to generate gap-filling patent applications. This is a huge thing. I really think like the patent system and the IP system at large about to collapse. Just saying. It's already pretty shitty, uh, but it's about to collapse, collapse with AI. This could put a strain on patent examination resources and raise questions about the validity of such patents. In terms of copyright law, author explains that works created by AI without human intervention or involvement cannot be copyrighted. However, works created with the assistance of AI. Oh, so if there was no human involved, if the model start to end makes the idea, then it's just not patentable. That's crazy. Um, but if, you involve, you're, if you're involved in prompting or something, then you're involved. However, works created with the assistance of AI may be copyrightable if they involve sufficient human authorship. U.S. Copyright Office requires applicants in, to disclose the use of AI-generated material in the copyright applications. Discusses the limitations of fair use and transformative use in the context of generative AI. Okay, I don't really care that much, honestly. Fact-based court judgment prediction and this abstract, extended abstract is all it is. What? I'm, I guess it's a consent, extended abstract. Present their research and fact-based court judgment and prediction within the context of the Indian legal documents. Introduce two problem variations, one based solely on facts and other combining. I don't care enough. What, what the heck? Exploring the hierarchical structure of human plans via program generation. Explores how humans create hierarchical plans, which are plans that break down complex tasks into smaller subtasks. The authors use an experimental paradigm where participants create programs in a game called Lightbot, which requires hierarchical planning. The programs created by participants serve as explicit representations of the hierarchical plans uh, compared to all established principles of human behavior, utility maximization, and minimum description length uh, to see if they can explain the hierarchical structure of human plans. Find that humans are sensitive to both metrics, but they also identify a qualitative feature of human-created programs that is not captured by these principles. Specifically, people prefer programs with reuse of subroutines, even when it doesn't result in shorter programs. Interesting. Don't care enough, though. Dichotomy of early and late phase implicit biases can provably induce grokking. Investigate the phenomenon of grokking. Da, 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 da. Aim to provide a theoretical understanding of grokking and explain why the transition is often sharp. Um, focus on neural networks with large initialization, small weight decay, which have been shown to induce grokking in various tasks. Analyze the training dynamics of these networks and prove that there is a dichotomy of early and late phase implicit biases that leads to grokking. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. The case classification task, the authors show that gradient flow gets trapped in a kernel regime during the initial phase of training. Or is this out of Princeton, Stanford, Michigan? In this regime, the network behaves as if it were optimizing a linearized model. After a certain period of time, the network transitions to the rich regime where it escapes the kernel regime and makes efforts to maximize the margin. Prove that this transition is sharp, meaning that it happens suddenly rather than gradually. Uh, provide theoretical results for both classification and regression tasks, and they also provide concrete examples of grokking and sparse linear classification and matrix completion. Show that the early phase implicit bias leads to a solution that does not generalize well. While late phase implicit bias leads to a solution that is better generalization. Potential critique of this work is that it focuses on homogeneous neural networks with specific training setups. Um, implications are significant understanding the generalization behavior of neural networks. Findings suggest that the sharp transition from memorization to generalization and grokking can be attributed to the interplay between early and late phase implicit biases, including induced by large initialization and small weight decay. But it can happen without weight decay is the thing. Grokking can happen. I'm, I, um, my viewers, sorry, I'm not aware of this. Um, part of the reason I haven't been uploading paper videos in a while is I've been reading just exclusively grokking papers, basically. Um, I think I am now, I think I've read probably 90% of the grokking papers out there, period, at this point. Um, uh, but grokking can be done without uh, weight decay. This understanding can potentially inform the design of more effective training strategies and shed light on the mechanisms underlying generalization in neural networks. Um, I've got to add this one because i got to add to the list because I have to do a literature review on grokking, or not full literature review, but like a little cover my bases type thing before um, 
in the early sections of my understanding paper. Oh boy, we've added seven so far. God damn. I'm so behind my paper readings. Data set distillation and large data era. Focus on the task of data set distillation, which aims to generate a smaller but representative subset of a large data set. Goal is to create a distilled data set that can be used to train models efficiently while still achieving good performance in the original data set. The author proposed a new approach called curriculum data augmentation for data set distillation, and they demonstrate its effectiveness on large scale data sets such as ImageNet 1K and ImageNet 21K. Um. Are those data sets that big? 1K, 21K? That sounds small in my head, although, I don't know. I guess I'm comparing it to tokens and language sequences, which I'm what I'm more used to, and it's kind of different. Core assertion is that the proposed CDA approach outperforms existing methods for data isolation, including blah, 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 show that by incorporating a curriculum learning framework during the data synthesis phase, you can generate synthetic data that captures more accurate and more informative features in the original data set. This leads to improved performance when training models in the digital data sets. Mechanics uh, involve designing a curriculum of difficulty levels for the data synthesis process. Difficulty level of the synthesized data is controlled by adjusting the lower and upper bounds of the crop scale and the data augmentation step. Proposed three strategies for curriculum learning, constant learning. I don't care enough, honestly. Data acquisition, a new frontier in data-centric AI. Challenges of data acquisition in the context of machine learning proposes a benchmark called DAM uh, to address these challenges. Uh, Author first analyze existing data marketplaces and identify a lack of transparency in pricing, standardized data formats, and ML aware acquisition guidance as key issues. Argue that a data marketplace for ML should have a budget awareness, price transparency, multiple data providers, and useful information sharing. Oh, that's cool. A little like call to action, I guess, to make a nice, easy to use data market. Damn, Benchmark simulates a data marketplace where data providers sell labeled data sets and data acquirers purchase subsets of these data sets. Pricing function for each data set depends on the number of samples purchased. Data providers share a small number of samples and summary statistics with the potential buyers. Data acquirer has a budget, an evaluation data set, and a training model. Goal is to optimize the acquisition strategy to maximize performance of the training model on evaluation data sets within a given budget. Highlight the challenges in the current data marketplace, such as limited information sharing, varying data formats, and ad hoc pricing models. Argue that an ideal data marketplace should provide budget awareness, price transparency. This is kind of cool. No reason to actually read it um, as far as a recent-ish, or sorry, a, a soon-to-be-done thing, um, but I am thinking about like how do you sell your data as individuals, if anything, not as companies with data. So, interesting. Virginia Tech paper. Gogies. Continual learning with low rank adaptation. Uh, address the problem of catastrophic forgetting and continual learning where a model loses performance on previously learned tasks when trained on new tasks. Propose a method called continual low rank adaptation that leverages low rank adaptation to update a pre-trained transformer model. LoRa constrains the update to a low rank one which reduces the number of parameters that need to be updated and retains the performance of previous tasks. Yeah, we know. Um, so they just use a LoRa as your continual update? I'm confused. Compare and color with the other methods that use prompt tuning, which is a parameter efficient fine tuning method, commonly used NLP. They show that color outperforms these prompt based methods in domain incremental learning and class incremental learning benchmarks. Color achieves state of the art results while still being parameter efficient. I don't like the whole add new parameters thing. It's just no. That's not the that's not the route, I don't think. Propose an extension called Color Plus Plus, which improves the unsupervised data set identification strategy by using the representation of the fine tuned model. Um this is not for me, but uh, I think I should probably send this to Patrick in the Discord. Analysis of the expected L2 error of an overparameterized deep neural network estimate learned by gradient descent without regularization. That was a mouthful. Analyze the statistical performance of overparameterized deep neural network estimates on in non-parametric regression settings. Consider a random vector x, y, where x represents the input variables and y represents the response variable. Goal is to estimate the regression function using a deep neural network. Why? To find an estimate that fits an overparameterized deep neural network to the data using gradient descent. Network consists of a linear combination of fully connected neural networks, and the weights are learned by minimizing the empirical L2 risk. Importantly, the authors show that a regularization term is not necessary to obtain good results. Whatever. A 
a survey of blockchain, AI, and edge computing for Web3, uh, address the issues of trust, centralization, and data ownership in the current web environments, focus on three key technologies that are essential for the development of Web3, blockchain, AI, and edge computing, provide a detailed analysis of each technology and its relevance to Web3, they discuss the fundamental concepts of blockchain, including consensus, blah, 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 explore the applications of blockchain, blah, blah, blah. Um, Delve into the role of AI in Web3, highlighting the potential to create an intelligent and semantic web. Discussion of AI models such as autoregression, autoregression and transformers, blah, 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 blah. Also explore the application of AI in Web3. This is probably useful. Who's this? Where's this out of? LA, some low Louisiana Tech University. Um, not that this is actually, I've done too many blockchain rough papers blockchain AI intersection honestly but um might be worth a site at some point if i ever get into that area maybe i don't know probably gonna delete it later honestly a survey and analysis of evolutionary operators for permutations Survey and analyze evolution operators for permutations, which are commonly used to solve combinatorial optimization problems. Discuss various mutation and crossover opera operators that have been developed over the years for evolving permutations. Provides a detailed description of each operator, including how it works, its runtime complexity, and the permutation features it focuses on. Mutation operators discussed in the paper include swap, adjacent swap, blah, 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 blah. Explains the behavior of each operator and discusses their strengths and weaknesses. I don't know what's happening here. I don't really care. Um, all right uh, that is it for today as always if you want to read these summaries check out my newsletter link in description to my Substack newsletter uh, it has prereq knowledge in case you want to read the papers make sure you know this prereq knowledge beforehand uh, so you understand stuff and citations that are probably incorrect uh, please like subscribe all the YouTube things that I should be asking you to do uh, yeah oh, oh the discord Join the Discord. Discord is going to go crazy soon is the goal. We've got some weird stuff working on it. We're going to hopefully make it a very weird Discord. Uh, very excited. Uh, yeah, end of video.